last night in New York, the Rangers tried to erase 54 years of frustration in their bid for the Stanley Cup. While over at Shea, Doc Gooden took the mound 54 days after his last win. The Rangers would be denied, however, in their quest to capture the cup at home. Doc Gooden was also denied victory as Moise Salou of the Montreal Expos homered twice and drove in five runs against the doctor. Mike Keenan and Dallas Green both look for victories against their Canadian foes. First, the Mets and the Expos, next on nine. Stadium in New York. Tonight, the Mets take on the Montreal Expos. Mets Baseball 94 is brought to you by Budweiser Beachwood Age for a crisp, clean, classic taste. By the American Express card. Don't leave home without it. By Las Vegas, where new resorts, attractions, and entertainment are creating a world of excitement in one amazing place. By MetLife, get met, it pays. By your tri-state Toyota dealer, I love what you do for me, Toyota. And by Coca-Cola, always plain, always Coca-Cola. Pitching for the Expos tonight, Ken Hill with a record of 8-3, an earned run average of 3.14. And on the mound for the Mets, Bobby Jones, he's won six and lost four, an earned run average at 3.10. Hello, I'm McCarver and Ralph Kiner back at Shea Stadium. The umpires gathering around home plate. They have just exchanged lineup cards. Felipe Alou, the manager of the Expos. Bobby Wine, the bench manager of the Mets. And we're just about set to go. Bobby Jones looking for victory number seven. He is six and four on the year. Lifetime, he's only two and seven here at Shea Stadium, two and four this year, but a four and oh record on the road. Inexplicable. Bobby doesn't know why that's the case because Shea Stadium is usually a pitcher's friend, and the history of the Mets will prove that. And the Expo lineup is brought to you by your new Dodge dealer. It'll be Marquise Grissom leading off. He'll be in center field. Batting second, the first baseman Cliff Floyd. Batting third in left field, Moise Salou, a great night last night. Batting fourth, the right fielder, Larry Walker. Batting fifth, the catcher, Darren Fletcher. Batting in the sixth position, the shortstop, Will Cordero. Batting seventh, the third base, Mike Lansing. Batting eighth, the second baseman, Freddie Benavides. And the pitcher, Ken Hill, batting ninth. The defense for the Mets this evening. Kevin McReynolds will be the left fielder. Ryan Thompson's been hot with the bat. He plays center. Joe Orsalak in right. Bobby Bonilla at third. Jose Vizcaino at short. Fernando Vina giving Jeff Kent a rest this evening. David Segui at first. And Todd Hunley behind the plate. The umpires for tonight's game, Jeff Kellogg behind home plate. The crew chief, Bruce Freming, in his 24th season, and he is a character. He's at first. Second base, second base umpire is Wally Bell. Mike Winters will be down at third base this evening. So a couple of umpires in that group in only their second season. And in his second season, as the manager of the Expos is Felipe Alou. He is going after victory number 200 after obtaining victory number 1,000 last July. Now, what does that mean? Well, in his career professionally, and that includes eight minor, make that 12 minor league seasons, he won over 800 in the minor leagues, 199 here in the big leagues and looking for number 200 tonight. And he'll become the fastest Expo manager to win 200 games in their history. 
Chris, you don't know how uh, revealing that is because the Expos entered the league back in 1969 as Marquise Grissom takes a strike from Bobby Jones. Yeah, Gene Mock, the manager, yeah. there, didn't have a chance. No. I mean, for seven years, the Expos, a fledging, fledgling uh, outfit. There's a strike on the corner to Grissom, batting 261 on the year, but he does have 20 steals and is just picking up the pace. And he lines one to center base hit. So after two straight strikes to Grissom, Bobby Jones finding too much of the plate, and Grissom with a base First hit to center. Number 30, Cliff. Well, Grissom with 250 stolen bases. Just three stolen bases behind Andre Dawson for second in the history of the Expo base dealers. And he's a threat to go here. Two stolen bases in last night's game. Cliff Floyd, the first baseman, stands up there. Cliff, 21 years old. The Expos sporting two young players, Will Cordero, the shortstop's only 22, and Floyd only 21. Monster numbers last year at Harrisburg, the double-A affiliate of the Expos. 101 runs batted in in 101 games. That's a lot and a little. Ball one to Cliff Floyd. Big guy. You see how rangy he is. He's 6'4", 220 pounds from Markham, Illinois. Born in Chicago. That's kind of odd because he hasn't had uh, the plate appearances against left-handed pitching that he has against right-handers. But Bobby Jones, after two strikes in a row to Grissom and then the single by Marquise, falls behind Floyd 2-0. Just underway on a lovely evening for baseball. Little looper to left, and it looks like it may drop and will. So Grissom hit one to center off the handle. Floyd hits one to left off the end of the bat, and that'll bring up Moise Salou, probably the hottest hitter among the Expo batters. Moise Salou. Oh, just barely getting enough of the bat in the ball to bloop it in the left field. No chance at all for McReynolds. Montreal with 10 hits in last night's ball game. Now with two already in their first two batters. Matter of fact, the Mets opponents have had six straight games in which they have gotten 10 hits or more. Including last night's game, a game won by Montreal 9 to nothing. And the curve is over to a loop. What a night he had last night. Mm. Two home runs, five runs batted in, four for five. The Mets finally got him out his last time up when he fought out the right. Ground ball, base hit to left field. Grissom's going to score, and the Expos, with three straight singles, lead it 1 0. Yet, but that doesn't mean that they haven't gotten the base hits. First run of the game going to the Montreal Expos. Got and a variety of handshakes in the in the dugout too. It's a high changeup. But Lou just gets enough of it to get it through the hole. No chance for a play at the plate. Grissom has that outstanding speed, and the Expos draw first blood. And are threatening to have a big inning. Two out, nobody on. Grissom has scored the first run of the game for Montreal as Larry Walker takes strike one. It is frightening when you look at Moises Alou, not only looking like his dad from a facial standpoint, but also has his dad's batting stance. And Larry Walker hammers one to left center. Walker will go into second base. That is his 28th double of the year, and Montreal leads it two to nothing. Walker, Walker leading the National League in doubles. 
He also leads the National League at extra base hits. That's his 37th extra base hit. So the first four batters have all had base hits. This ball really wasn't hit that hard. It was kind of sliced out the center, but it was hit harder than the other three, but they all count. Parker gets his 39th run battered in. He's on a pace to drive in 100. Larry Walker with 37 extra base hits. So Walker with his 28th double. And Darren Fletcher, the catcher, is the batter, and he takes ball one. Four straight hits for the Expos here in the top of the first inning. A rude greeting for Bobby Jones, who continues his miseries at Shea Stadium. He just cannot pitch well here so far. This one tapped foul, one and one. You see those five home runs for Darren Fletcher, the Montreal catcher. He went 38 days without scoring a run other than a ball hit with a home run. Pretty good indication that the batters behind him are not having a lot of RBIs because Darren's hitting 299. He's getting on base a lot. Home run in last night's ball game. Hit it off Mike Maddox. It's two balls and a strike to Fletcher. Change, tap toward third. Fielded by Biscaino. And Alou was caught in between, and he's kicking the bag at third base. Now, that's a bad base running mistake at third. He should have scored easily. The infield was back. Yeah, but he didn't know whether Bonilla was going to field the ball or not. That, in, in fairness to Alou. Ball gets by Bonilla. And you see Alou holding there. He wasn't sure. You're right, Tim. And then this guy, you know, gets the out at first base. So the Mets finally get an out. And it was a fifth batter to be thrown into that situation of the first out of the game. I think with one out, he tries it anyway. But you, uh, that was a good shot, and it kind of gave you an idea of what Alou was thinking and where he was looking. Bonilla went after the ball like he had a shot at it. But Will Cordero takes ball one. Now the infield in for the Mets as it's one and nothing to Cordero. Here you see the ball hit just by Bonilla and Alou was moving back toward third and the runner at second thinking that the runner in front of him was going to score almost gets trapped off at second. That was Larry Walker. That's a good point you saw in your in your screen that Walker had almost broken too far. One and one to Cordero. And now I think even with the infield in ground ball you go on contact. Bottom of the order coming up. You have a two nothing lead. Cordero taps it foul. A ball and two strikes to Will only 22 years old as we mentioned. This is a big, big man to get out right here. If you can get him out and get out of this inning with only two runs scoring, you keep the Mets in the ball game. Cordero, as you see, has had a tough time driving them in this year. It's one and two to Will Cordero. Two nothing Expos. Strike three call. Well, that could be a big strikeout for Bobby Jones. Two outs now. Well, Cordero thinks it's inside, but it looks like it gets the inside corner. Might have been a little borderline as low. It was close. Very close. Todd Hunley with a good job of holding the ball. Pitchers like for catchers to do that because it gives the umpire just that little extra look. But Will Cordero, who had a good look at it himself, says, nope, that ball was inside. But... Not so, says Jeff Kellogg, as Mike Lansing, the third baseman, takes a slider outside. Jones has the luxury here of pitching this batter very tough. First base is open. 
Benavides is the batter on deck. The eighth batter in the batting order. In Lansing bows it back one and one. You notice how with a runner on at second base and a good base runner in Larry Walker, an experienced player, how Todd Hundley sets up late. He gives the sign, is down on his haunches, and not until Jones is in his delivery home does Hundley move. Check him out. Inside and it hits Lansing. It looked like the right hand. Oh boy. So Mike Lansing is hit, I think, on the right thumb with the Bobby Jones fastball. Ball tailing in. A lot of times when pitchers try to pitch around batters, that often happens, Ralph, because you're pitching a hitter off the plate. Third batter hit by Jones this year. And they had to get the gloves off to find out what actually happened. Either the ring finger, yep, looks like the ring finger of the right hand. No place for that finger to go. That is finger on wood that was crushed. Looking at it again, pitch is right at him. Mm, boy. Yeah, they'll they'll uh, take Lansing out of the game, and Mike will, I'm sure, be X-rayed. And we are hopeful that it's not broken. Uh, here's a guy from Wyoming. Had his parents and a lot of friends at his opening day. It was opening day for him at least last year in Denver. Everybody driving down from Wyoming. He had left about 53 passes. So he's only in his second full year and here suffering what uh, could be a serious injury. John Barry will be the runner for him and will stay in the game and play third base. There's Sean Barry at first base and now Hunley wants to talk to Bobby Jones as Freddie Benavides is at the plate. So we will try to have a report on Mike Lansing of course when we receive one. Base is loaded, two outs, two runs in for the Expos here in the first inning. Benavides batting 235 on the year, and Hunley with a backhand stop. One ball, no strikes to Benavides. Lansing in pain. Uh, you, I would imagine the trainer of the Expos. Uh, in to get some ice. What is Mike still doing on the bench? Yeah. I would think he's uh, he would be headed to the training room, ice it down, get it x-rayed, and the slider misses to Benavides. So it's two balls and no strikes to Fred. He is in a lot of pain, and now trainer of the Expos down to try to talk him into going inside. Jones is out of it, but the Expos scoring two. It could have been worse. They lead 2-0. Mets coming up after this from Coca-Cola Classic. Bottom of the first inning, the Mets trailing 2-0, and they have spotted a very hot pitcher, two runs. Kenny Hill traded from the Cardinals to the Expos three years ago for Andres Galarraga. So Kenny Hill on the mound for the Expo. And this Mets lineup is brought to you by your Tri-State Quality Ford dealer. It'll be Jose Vizcaino to lead it off. Batting second, the second baseman, Fernando Vina. Batting third in left field, Kevin McReynolds. Batting fourth and playing third base, Bobby Bonilla. Batting fifth in right field, Joe Orsalak. Batting sixth, the first baseman, David Segui. Batting seventh, the catcher, Todd Hundley. 
Batting in the eighth position, the center fielder Ryan Thompson and Bobby Jones, who will do the pitching, batting in the ninth position. And we'll take a look at the defense of the Expos. Probably the best defensive outfield in the National League. A Lou Grissom and Walker. Sean Barry is in there for Mike Lansing. Cordero Benavides, Cliff Floyd at first. And Darren Fletcher behind the plate. Jose Biscaino with a 13 game hitting streak is the batter. Make that 16 game hitting streak. Take strike one. Nothing in one to Biscaino. Single his first time up on his first pitch to extend that streak yesterday. There's a splitter from Hill, and this guy is really a tough assignment. A very heavy sinking fastball, a good splitter. And a slider. Slider's probably his third best pitch. Outside with a fastball, one and two to Vizcaino. 16 straight games with at least one base hit, hitting 347. The Mets' record is 18 straight games by Daryl Strawberry. Back in 1990, and a liner, but for Daryl, the shortstop makes the catch. That was that splitter. Biscaino going about it the right way. If you try to pull Ken Hill, he'll eat you up. He hit this ball right off the end of the bat. Little looper at the shortstop and right into the glove of the shortstop, Cordero. Fernando Vina, the batter. Fernando giving Jeff Kent a rest this evening. Right handers batting only 206 against Hill this year as Vina tries to bunt, but it's foul. Fernando continues to play well. He has done that since spring training when he really opened the eyes of the Mets Brain Trust, headed by Dallas Green. Loops it foul, nothing at two to Vina. Fernando started the last season. And as you take a look at Felipe Alou trying to get the attention of second baseman Fred ben Benavidez to move to his left. That's unusual with Vina hitting. Vina's not, not that much of a pull hitter. But Benavidez, the second baseman, moving to his left in the hole. Line drive, base hit left field. You don't know what kind of scouting reports uh, guys get, but especially with two strikes, why would Felipe Alou move Benavidez over in the hole at first? It's just about universally known that he is not a pull hitter, but evidently they either know something or they haven't been given the right information. But Vina does what is normal for him with a two strike count. He hits straight away and he hits it to left field. Of course, no defense would have stopped that base hit. Being a threat to run as Kevin McReynolds comes up. McReynolds batting 226 on the year, and he hits this one to right center, and Walker can't get to it. Being could score on this ball. He's going to try the throw by Cordero. Safe at home. Being just beat it. Two to one expo. Defense getting that ball back in a hurry as McReynolds takes the fastball in the right center field. The throw in on the relay is perfect, but the slide just there in time. The call of safe by Jeff Kellogg. And drop that straight in slide. Had he hooked into Fletcher, he Fletcher spins him off, but that straight in slide did it for Vina. Here's Bonilla. All one to Bobby. Who is 0 for his last nine? Mac Reynolds at second base, one out, two to one, Montreal. Hit hard by the diving Floyd. Mac Reynolds will try to score and make it 
And the Mets have tied it with three hits of their own here in the bottom of the first. I'm amazed that Walker didn't throw home. It looked like he had a good shot to pick up McReynolds. He's got a great arm. But evidently thinking that he'd keep the go ahead run at first base and not take the chance of throwing home. That's interesting because with Floyd diving for the ball there's no cutoff. That's very true. He had nobody to cut it off. And so he goes to second base with the throw to make sure that the go ahead run doesn't go in the scoring position. Good thinking. Walker's one of the most one of the most outstanding outfielders in the game. He's throwing three runners out at first base. He doesn't make many mistakes does no, he? No he thinks. There's the first baseman on the dirt. He can't be in the cutoff position. So Walker doesn't throw. If the throw goes all the way home and they don't get the runner, then they have the go ahead run at second base. In the person of Bobby Bonilla, Joe Orsalak now tries to bunt his way on. And he fouls it off. Nothing in one to Orsalak and a lot of action here in the first inning. There have been seven hits already. Outside, ball one to Joe, one and one to Orsola. For Bonilla, by the way, that was his 35th RBI of the year. Bobby breaking that 0 for 9 slump, and it looked like he hit a pretty good pitch that split her down and away. There goes Bonilla, hit and run was on. Orsolak to Floyd, and it's just fair. As Bonilla goes to second base. And you see the runner going the ball fielded just in time by the first baseman as the ball takes a good hop for the Montreal Expos and doesn't go foul. So they get the out. So Floyd made the tag. Boni is at second base. David Segui, the first baseman, is up. offense for David Segui. He scored 12 runs in 13 games, but hasn't driven home a run in six. Nothing in one to David Segui. Segui, a home run against Montreal up in Montreal earlier this year that won a game for the Mets, hit it in the eighth inning, and Mel Rojas. Very, very, very important. Today, Player Relations Committee President Richard Ravage said that uh, he will present the club's economic proposal for a new basic agreement to the media following the negotiating session with the Major League Baseball Players Association on Tuesday, June 14th at the New York Sheraton. That is next Tuesday. The media presentation will take place in the New York Ballroom B third floor, and that will be fully covered by not only the New York media, but by the national media. Press conference to take place at 3 o'clock. As Marquise Grissom takes ball one, he single scored a run in the first. The owners will present a salary cap proposal to the Players Relationship Committee. Players Relation Committee. One and one to Grissom. And of course, that will be a new innovation. It has never been approached before. They've talked about it. Salary cap would mean that there would be a type of salary cap on the maximum salaries for a team that they pay each year. Two balls and a strike to Grissom. It took uh, Richard Ravage, the negotiator and representative of the owners, 18 months to convince the owners to approve a revenue sharing plan. And most of the owners said, no revenue sharing plan without a salary cap. Ergo, 
28 to nothing vote on Tuesday in Cincinnati. And it is assumed that the salary cap proposal is the proposal that will be made. But in what wording, we don't know yet. And the union doesn't know yet. And Donald Fear, the head of the Players Association, will find that out on Tuesday afternoon at the Sheraton here in New York. It is a very, very, very important announcement. As Marquise Grissom takes ball four. And we will have that for you. We're on the air at 7.30 on Tuesday night, and we will have that, if not the press conference, all of the information concerning the press conference at the beginning of our game on, on Tuesday night. As Cliff Floyd, the first baseman, steps up. Cliff, a single and a run scored in the first inning. 2-2 here in the second. Swing came around and hit Todd Hundley on the helmet, and that's one of the reasons catchers wear those hard hats behind home plate. That used to be they had that soft felt cap, and you can obviously get seriously hurt that way. That backlash as the bat goes all the way around. Catchers try to get as close as they can underneath the batter. Sometimes you get too close. And the reason for that is you want to catch the ball as high, the low pitches, as high as you can up under the hitter to entice the umpire to call as many low strikes as possible. That's the reason that catchers get as close as they can. This one popped up the left field, an easy play for Kevin McReynolds. Two outs here in the second. Well, a fine ball player coming to the plate right now. Moises Alou, RBI number 35, his first at bat, and we told you how scary it was that he looked like his dad with that batting stance. He looks facially like his father, but, I mean, the genes are traced all the way to the hands and the way you hold the bat. He holds it uh, similar to his dad, and he follows through like his dad. Grissom a threat to run. 20 stolen bases on the year. 250 on his career. Felipe Alou in the left-hand side of your screen. And this one is hit deep to left field. Over is McReynolds near the line, near the wall. Gone. Home run, Moises Alou. And the Expos take the lead again, 4-2. to two. He hits like his father, too. Six for seven against the Mets in this series. Three home runs. Eight runs batted in. He is coming on to be one of the great stars in this game of baseball. And last year, he broke his leg. Seriously broke his leg. It's amazing he's able to be back in play as well as he has done here this year. Larry Walker jammed on the curve. He makes the third out. But Moises Alou continues his red hot hitting at four to two. Expos, middle of the second. We're back after this from the Bell Atlantic Yellow Pages. Well, he is a remarkable young player. Ralph talking about uh, that horrible broken leg last year on September 16th but we talked about the follow through in the swing of his father as opposed to him check this out identical stances almost identical heredity certainly shows here this is a swing of Felipe Alou beautiful swing great follow through this is the home run that Moises Alou just hit Boy. look at the comparison of those two swings heredity Todd Hundley, the batter, here to open the second inning. When uh, Moises Alou was born, Philippe Alou on that same day hit a home run, so I guess it carries right on through. The splitter and a good one, nothing in two. 
Felipe Alou, we mentioned before, a player for 16 years in the major leagues, a minor league manager for 12 years. How many stars would go down and manage for 12 years in the minor leagues? I can't Not think of many. any. Yeah. That was close to Huntley, one and two to Todd. Last year on May 16th, Todd Huntley hit a home run with two out in the ninth inning to tie a game against Ken Hill, and it cost Hill a win. Montreal did go on to win that ball game in extra innings, but Hill did not get the decision. Huntley with that home run taking a win away with two men out in the ninth inning. Inside, ball two, two and two to Huntley. The splitter Hundley wants to look at the ball three and two to Todd four to two Expos on top of the Mets bottom of the second inning and the splitter gets it so Hundley's down on strikes one out here in the second inning and Ryan Thompson coming up incidentally we talked about Hundley in that game in Cincinnati that Huntley was charged with an error on and uh, the newspapers quoted him as saying that he trailed the play and was away from home plate and couldn't get back. Huntley has told us he did not tell that to the newspapers and that he was there for the throw and it was not his admission of trailing the play that he was they quoted him on that fact so Huntley certainly has denied those statements that were written at the time. One and nothing to Thompson. And the slider is high. Ball two. Ryan batting 260, his highest average since May 1st. Todd saying that there were about 10 or 12 reporters around him, and who got the quote, he doesn't know. This one hit hard to shortstop. Cordero on a high throw throws out Thompson, two out said uh, he holds no animosity whatsoever toward the writers but there was there was no comment by him that he trailed the play when Deion Sanders was on at second base representing the tying run in Cincinnati last Sunday a ball that was returned Lenny Harris was the batter runners at second and third and two outs the Mets up by two in the ninth inning Harris hit a slow ball to shortstop Bang bang play at first. Harris was safe. Sanders tried to score. He stopped between home and third. And Todd said that he tried to look toward third to see where Sanders was. And when he looked toward Sagi, the ball was on top of him. He closed the glove too quickly. And he said he made an error. And he'll make a lot more errors. But he was not trailing the play. So after two, Todd and the Mets trail by two, and we're back after this from Budweiser. Darren Fletcher leads it off for Montreal here in the third inning of a 4-2 game. Moises Alou again. Five RBIs last night, three tonight. Three home runs in seven at-bats. Fletcher grounded to short his first time up. And the curve is inside, two and one to Darren Fletcher. Mets pitchers have now given up 33 earned runs in their last 37 innings. It's almost a run an inning over a four game period on average. So the pitching has been woeful of late. Three and one to Fletcher. Fly ball deep to center, but Ryan Thompson there. And he makes the catch. One out here in the third. Will Cordero, the shortstop, coming up. Shortstop. Well, folks, there's a break in the action. Ought to be a great time to break for the great taste of Bud Light. Big hit with fans everywhere because it won't fill you up, never let you down, so make it a Bud Light. 
beautiful evening for baseball or anything else for that matter. About 60 degrees, low humidity. It looks like a Bud Light or a couple of Bud Lights in front of our camera there. <laughs> Will Cordero, the batter, he took a call third strike. First time up. down Broadway one and one to Cordero and Cordero was called out on strikes he was unhappy with that call there was something that happened the other day that I think should happen more often Raul Mondesi the outfielder for the Dodgers was ordered to hit get in the batter's box by Joe West the umpire fly ball to right should be easy for us like two out Mondesi did not get into the batter's box so Joe West ordered the pitcher to pitch the ball was not in the strike zone but it was called a strike that's all in the rule book and it can be done. And I really think Joe West is, should start that and hopefully started a trend there to get batters into that batter's box to speed up the game of baseball. And Joe West, a controversial type umpire, there's no doubt about it. And that will receive some controversy, but a very good call by him. Well, we understand as you see. Sean Barry hit for the first time. The reason he's in the game is Mike Lansing was hit on the ring finger of the right hand, and the x rays were negative. We're pleased for Mike, but there is a deep bone bruise in the ring finger of his right hand, but it's not broken, and it's 0 and 2 to Sean Barry. I agree with that. If a hitter takes an inordinate time to get in the box, however, if a hitter if, if a guy like Mike Hargrove, for instance, the manager of the Cleveland Indians, who took forever to get ready, I think uh, I think you ought to make him change his habits. But to me, I mean, Mondesi was not the type of guy who took a long time, unless he just did it on that one at bat. One at bat, it might have been just that one at bat. As it turned out, he ended up getting a base hit, even though he lost that extra strike. Dave Weathers was the pitcher of the Florida Marlins. Who was ordered to throw the pitch? And the rule book says you could, it's a strike call. Whatever he could roll it up there. It'll right. be a strike. Two and two to Barry. And Sean is out. First time the Expos have gone in order after two and a half. Four to two Montreal. Back after this from your Cadillac Tri Statesman. Fans, Sharp Electronics 1969 Commemorative Cap Day is Sunday, June 26. All fans attending the 140 Mets Pirate Game will receive a replica of the cap worn by the 1969 World Championship New York Mets. The Miracle Mets, as a matter of fact. And for all ticket information or to charge seats by phone, call 718-507-TIXX during business hours. A per-ticket service charge applies. And don't forget to ask about the new right field attraction opening this summer, Nickelodeon Extreme Baseball, right here at Shea. Now the Miracle Mets, and they were indeed the Miracle Mets with the strong pitching of Tom Seaver. Nolan Ryan in the bullpen, if you can believe it. Jose Vizcaino, high chopper towards second. Benavides has to hurry, and he does, to get Vizcaino one out on one pitch here in the third inning. It was on this day in 1969, the Mets won their 11th consecutive ball game. That was a Mets record and still stands as the most consecutive wins the Mets have ever had. 11 straight in 1969. Gary Gentry, Jerry Kuzman, Ed Cranepool, Red Garrett at third, Kenny Boswell at second, Art Shamsky. And where was Felipe Alou then? With the Atlanta Braves. Hitting a lot of balls hard. Jerry Grody, the best defensive catcher that I've ever seen. Better than Bench. A notch above Johnny Bench. And boy, you'd think that isn't saying something. Right center. Two pitches, two outs here in the third inning. I did not get along with Jerry Grody as a player. 
I'm not alone in that <laughs> no, category. That's nothing new. Matter of fact, Jerry and I don't don't even speak on old timers days now. <laughs> <laughs> that's how long it carries over. It is laughable. I agree with you. You're laughing. Under your <laughs> were there any players? That, were there any guys that uh, that you played with or against uh, that that you had those feelings? Oh, to I think you yeah, played? you definitely have it. Uh, that you run into people like that. Jerry Grody uh, was a extremely affable person when he was out of uniform. He was a lot easier to get along with. The newspaper people didn't like him at all. He was very gruff and abrasive. Two balls and a strike to Kevin McReynolds, an RBI double in the first. We just had a uh, little video here in the ballpark, and Tug McGraw opened up by saying, <laughs> I mean, it was just a little 30-second squib about Jerry Grody and his great catching ability, and and he uh, started out with a negative remark about J Jerry. You might not like him. Yeah, he but. said, it doesn't matter what kind of person he was, he was but. a great catcher. <laughs> <laughs> two and two to McReynolds. And Kevin down on strikes. That is eight in a row now, retired by Ken Hill. He has a 4-2 lead after three, and we'll be back after this from your New York Chevrolet Geo dealer. Freddie Benavidez, the second baseman, leads it off. Montreal blue and the Mets blue. It's Mets are blue. Four to two. The Expos and then to call it for you here in the top of the fourth, Ralph Kiner. All right, Tim and Benavides grounding out his first time up, batting for the second time. Bobby Jones on the mound for the Mets has been reached for four runs on five hits. And the first pitch hit on the ground to Bobby Bonilla, who guns it to first base, one away. Benavides hitting 235 coming into this game. And that'll bring up Ken Hill. Ken worked the count to three and two his first time up and then grounded out the second. Montreal 12 games over 500 for the second time this year. That's the highest they've been over 500 this season. And even with that fine record they trailed the Atlanta Braves who have the best record in baseball by three games. But they are leading in the wild card by two games over Houston and Cincinnati. And we'll check out the Macy's scoreboard. The Dodgers defeated the Cubs two to one. The Cubs winning their losing their tenth straight ball game. The Phillies leading the Cardinals. Marlins over the Pirates. Rockies leading the Reds. And the Braves leading the Astros. Chopper up the middle could be a base hit, and it will be. As Vina knew he had to either barehand it and make the play or he wouldn't have a chance at all. Tried to barehand it, couldn't do it. And a base hit for Ken Hill. That's a, an awfully hard ball to barehand. That ball with top spin on it. A ball that you could really hurt yourself on. Bunch of top spin on this ball. This is not an easy ball. This is not like a ball off the end of the bat. Fernando appears to be all right. But that's a ball that can split your hand. Hill getting his fourth hit of the year, and the batter is Marquise Grissom. A curveball for ball one. Grissom has singled and walked and scored twice. Montreal with six hits. Ball two, the fastball that time, two balls, no strikes. Bobby appeared uh, to have strained something in his right side when he made that pitch. It was a fastball low and away. That may not be the case. He may just be disgusted uh, with his location so far tonight. Watch after he follows through. And the head goes down. It's either an injury or disgust. We'll see on the next pitch. Two balls, no strikes. And a fly ball hit high enough to right that it'll be an easy play for Orsilak. Joel makes the catch. Hill back to first base. Two men out.
Bobby Jones will now work to Cliff Floyd, who has a base hit and two advance, a blue pit the left field. That was back in the first inning. Our Toyota American League scoreboard, the Blue Jays leading the Yankees one to nothing. Tie game there. Tie game there. And the tie game there. Thrice a try game. <laughs> <laughs> They're all tied. Toronto's extended their uh, lead, as a matter of fact, over the Yankees now to four to nothing. The Yankees losing last night to Toronto up at Sky Dome. They've lost three in a row. Yeah. And that pitch almost hits Floyd. As a matter of fact, last night the Yankees lose to Toronto. The Mets lose to Montreal. And the Rangers lose to Vancouver. National Anthem of Canada, oh Canada. Last night, as far as New York was concerned, it was oi, Canada. <laughs> Ground ball to Vigna, the second baseman. That retires the side. A hit, one left. The score at the end of three and a half innings. Montreal for the Mets, two. And here's a word from nobody beats the Wiz. Montreal for the Mets, two. And we'd like to remind you this game is brought to you by Nobody Beats the Wiz Home Entertainment Centers. And also by the Cadillac Tri-Statesman, the Cadillac dealers of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Mets batting trailing by two, and Bobby Bonilla will lead it off. Bonilla, single his first time up, drove in a run. 35th run batted in of the year. Bobby 0 for 3 in last night's ball game. He has had 10 hits and 31 at bats against Ken Hill, slightly above 300 against him, with one home run. Hill giving up two runs on three hits in the first inning, and since then the Mets have not had a base runner, and that pitch, ball one. Second baseman, Benavides. One man out. Benavides last year with the Colorado Rockies. Bryce right Hill Joe comes back to the hill to work to Joe Orsilak. Hill has a very unusual delivery. He throws like an infielder, sort of cocks his arm behind his back. And you would think he would put an awful strain on his pitching arm. There's that action that he has and he throws that first pitch for ball one. He was 6 and 0 last year on June 5th. However, he didn't win his 7th game until July 22nd. He ended up 9 and 7 last year did Ken. He was 16 and 9 his first year with the Expos. He is a quality reliever or a big pardon, a quality starter. Three balls, no strikes to Orsolak. Orsolak grounded out his first time up on a hit and run play. Fastball, strike one, three and one the count. And this one chopped to the first base side, fielded in fair territory by Floyd. Two men out. That's what he'll do, though. He'll make you hit the top half of the ball. Arcelac, an example, he has pounded that ball into the dirt in front of home plate twice tonight. Floyd, with two unassisted plays at first base. Ken Hill has won five on the road. Bobby Jones, by the way, four on the road. And Brett Saberhagen, the loser on Wednesday night, has also won five on the road. If you recall back in June of 1992, Hill pitched a one hitter against the Mets. The only hit was an infield hit by Anthony Young, who was the pitcher against him in that game. One ball, no strikes as David Zagi bats for the second time. He fouls this ball up in the air. It'll be out of play. One ball and one strike. 
Segui 0 for 3 last night with three strikeouts. Very strong ball game pitched last night by Pedro Martinez. He shut out the Mets by a score of nine to nothing. The first time the Mets have been shut out in the 1994 season, and the first time they have been shut out in their last 75 games. And also, that was the first complete game pitched against the Mets in the past 75 games. That's a pretty amazing stat to me that the Mets could not have a complete game pitched against them, especially with their record last year of 103 losses over that long period of time. Tommy Green pitched the complete game shutout the last time they were shut out before last night. Three and one the count as Hill falls behind for the second batter in this inning. This ball hit high in the air to right center. Just got under it a bit. It'll be a routine play for the center fielder Grissom, and that retires the side in order. 11 in a row for Ken Hill. The score at the end of four. The Expos four, the Mets two, and here's a word from the Bell Atlantic Yellow Pages. Four to two, Montreal, top of the fifth inning. And it will be Moises Alou to lead it off. He's had a single and a home run in this game with three runs batted in. Last night, he was four for five with two home runs and five runs batted in. What a series he has put together so far. A four-game series with Montreal. Tomorrow an afternoon ball game, game time at 1.40. And Sunday an afternoon ball game, game time at 1.40. And the first pitch, a breaking ball by Bobby Jones for ball one. Last year, we mentioned in July, his father won his 1,000th game as a manager. That included the minor leagues. And tonight, on that night last year, when his dad won 1,000 games, Alou hit two home runs. And he told Rich Griffin, the public relations director of the Expos, that he'd try to do something tonight to help his dad win his 200th major league game, and he certainly has done that. He's already, he's already done that as he takes again in this ball three, three and zero. Oh. Felipe Alou just sitting in back, relaxing and enjoying the performance of his son. There's a strike, three and one. Started today's action, second in the National League in hitting to Tony Gwynn. Gwynn at 376. That's ball four. And Alou is on as he leads off here in the fifth inning. That's a remarkable story. Uh, in an interview with Roy Firestone about a year ago, Felipe Alou saying that he was traveling all the time when his son was young. He has seven children in his second marriage, and Moises, a son of his, in his first marriage. And he said he was traveling, and even Moises said that, that he really didn't know his dad when he was younger because of all the baseball travel involved. And now here he is with a chance to know his dad because he's playing for him. They see one another every day and are very, very close friends. Whenever, usually, when you hear a son say that about his dad, that's uh, almost the quintessential definition of friendship. And his dad going overboard in the early part of his career not to show favoritism to his son. In fact, I think it was even a little bit detrimental to Moises Salou. Very classy man, Felipe Alou, who had two brothers that played in the major leagues. All three of the brothers outstanding ball players. Felipe, by far the best of them, even though Matty Alou led the National League in hitting one year. Ground ball is short. They'll try for two. They don't get it. This Cayeno to Vina, but the speed of Larry Walker batting from the left hand side of the plate. And the Mets just get the force play. I've talked to players, and they're aware of that little half shin guard that they wear. I think um, that may become as pet a peeve as warm up jackets that pitchers wear when they're on the bases. Larry Walker, I think a lot of players wear those half shin guards, shin guards because they hammer it down on their foot. Now he's got a something for his wrist. 
No, that's the half shin guard that he wears on his foot. That was Luis Pujols, the first base coach. <laughs> but he's putting something <laughs> on his wrist now. <laughs> and the next batter, Darren Fletcher, goes after the first pitch, pops it up to shallow left center, where McReynolds makes the play. You never wore a shin guard. Never did. Hit, did you? No. Did I was sick of them by the time I hit. <laughs> you had to take them off the hit. You had to take them off the hit. I didn't want to wear them anymore. So Bobby Jones trailing by two in this game, giving up two runs in the first and two in the second. Now has two men out in the fifth with a runner at first base. The batter will be Will Cordero, who is 0 for 2. That's Sean Barry on deck. He has one of those half shin guards. First one that I ever saw, Vic Wirtz wore. He used to foul the ball off his foot a lot. It's one thing I didn't do much of. Big curveball for a called strike as Cordero looks. He was called out on strikes in the first inning, fly to right in his next at bat. And Sean Barry, the on deck batter. Short lead at first by Walker, but he has eight stolen bases on the year. And this ball hit the left center field. Thompson will have to hurry. He does get there as that ball just carried well and stayed in the air long enough for Thompson to retire the side with his catch. A walk and one left to score at the end of four and a half innings. The Expos for the Mets two, and here's a word from your Tri-State Toyota dealer. All Hall of Famers, switch hitting Hall of Famers. With Mickey, the Man Mickey Mantle didn't even have a, a 300 average, and that's one thing the mix says uh, has really bothered him. I think it's 298. 299. 298, 298. Nothing and one to Todd Hunley. Todd thought the ball was outside. There are a strikeout victim his first time up. There are 11 switch hitters in the Hall of Fame. Only four of them are regular players. The other, the others don't count. Are pitchers? Yeah, they don't yeah. count. One and one to Hunley. Those four are Mickey Mantle, Frankie Frisch. Max Carey. Max Carey, right. And the other one is Dave Bancroft, which goes back a few years. Goes back to more than a few. Well, Max Carey and Chris both go back, and of course, Mantle. One ball, two strikes to Hundley with the Mets trailing 4-2 here in the fifth. You don't suppose they'd sneak one of those pitchers in there with a lifetime batting average of... Uh, they, can, well, that's they wouldn't not do that fair. to us. That no. doesn't count. Pitchers do not count. Guys like Vita Blue and you yeah. know, switch hitters. Yep. Hammered into the ground, and that's what Hill can make you do. Still 1-2 and two to Hundley. Pete Rose had a 300 batting average. You mentioned Willie McGee. He might be one. He had Willie some McGee, high. Yeah, yeah McGee uh, leading the league in hitting in 85 and 1989. Could be Willie McGee. Hunley down on strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> the guys at our control room have not figured it out yet that this is not that important. <laughs> Especially since it's not sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie Frisch, nice going, Ralph. The only player to bat 300 or better from both sides of the plate for his career. Frankie, the first MVP back in 1931. We'll try to see the follow-ups after this. Next pitch. It's one ball, no strikes. How about Carlos Borrega? This one fouled off. And it's one and one to Ralph Thompson. Or, or to uh, Ryan Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of you as a switch hitter. No, no. <laughs> Frankie Frisch, oh, uh, highest batting average in the Hall of Fame, 316. I thought it was 317. Rose, of course, not in the Hall of Fame. But will be one of these days. A ball and two strikes to Ryan Thompson, a.k.a. Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Outside, two and two to Ryan. A 
What's that line about Freudian slips? As long as you don't wear them. <laughs> Full count to Thompson. The splitter gets Thompson. So Hill, with his fourth strikeout and two in a row here in the fifth inning, has now retired 5 11, 13 Mets in a row. Two outs here in the fifth. And this is that split finger fastball. Basically a change up. And in the old days, a fork ball would be comparable to that pitch. Grounded back to Hill. So Ken had a hand in every out in the fifth inning. 4 2 Expos. We're back after this from Budweiser. With the tune of possibly the worst hit record in the history of music, Jerry Lee Lewis's Great Balls of Fire, a reminder that this copyrighted telecast is authorized under television rights granted by Sterling Doubleday Enterprises LP. It's only for the entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, or use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Sterling Doubleday Enterprises LP is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of the program, such as by charging admission for its showing, is likewise prohibited. Not only that, but it may be the most listened to song in the history of music. I mean, you hear it all the time, great balls of fire. Well, this, uh, a ball of fire that went through the, looked like it went through Bobby Jones' legs and into center field on one pitch, Sean Barry is aboard. With nobody out here in the sixth inning, four to two Montreal. Obviously, just kidding. Our friend Jerry Lee Lewis never criticized anyone from Memphis with me around. Right? That's right. Well, why didn't he sit down when he plays the piano? He uh, he does uh, have a tendency <laughs> to play the piano in various positions, <laughs> other than seated. Hit and run is on through the legs of Jones and Vina on a play. That was just superb. Nice play by Fernando Vina. Two outs on the double play. Well, you play the carom correctly and you got a double play. It's off of the glove, deflected over toward Vina, who handles it well, stays on the bag as he fields the ball, gets the out at second, and the double play as he throws on to first. Had Jones not touched that ball, it could have gone into center field. Don't know, but anyway, he flagged it down. Vina caught the carom, stepped on second, and doubled up Benavidez as Kenny Hill takes a strike. Seven hits for the Expos, only three for the Mets. Mets three hit in last night's game. Outside corner, nothing and two to Ken Hill. down on strike. Strikeout number three for Bobby Jones. The Expos have a 4-2 lead, middle of the six. We're back after this from Visa. Four to two, Expos on top of the Mets here in the bottom of the sixth inning, but that will not dampen the spirits of the Kiner clan. Diane, Ralph's wife, there, the left of your picture in the background. And Casey, your daughter, first time you've seen Casey in a while, I guess. That's Rob. right. And of course, she's in here because her husband, Robin Freeman, is playing in the Buick Open at Westchester. And happy to say, he's six under par. And there's Robin right there on the left side of the screen. And he's in contention to win the championship there at Westchester. Six, six under, under after two rounds, right? Two sixty nines, yeah. All right, there Robin. So All right. Here he is eating, eating popcorn and drinking Cokes, and he's six under. There, well, uh, he should be having steak. <laughs> Little Don Perignon or something. Uh. That's right. Well, so I guess Robin thinking never count your money while you're sitting at the table. And he's certainly not, especially in that game. That game is oof. Oof, tough. One ball, two strikes to Jose Vizcaino. Jose trying to punch it to left. He fouls it back. The Mets haven't had a hit since a two-out single. Make that a one-out single by Bobby Bonilla in the first inning. 
Since that time, Ken Hill has retired 14 in a row. Wow, that was close. Two and two to Vizcaino, who has a 16-game hitting streak on the line. 4-2 Expos here in the sixth. Splitter and nasty. Five strikeouts now for Ken Hill and Fernando Vina coming up. Well, you called it at the top of the show, Tim. This guy is tough to hit against. Heavy slider and that great fork ball right there for a changeup. This ball really a tough pitch to hit. No chance. 15 in a row now retired by Ken Hill as Fernando Vino is up. He has one of the three med hits. He wanted to bunt. He takes ball one. Mets had only three hits in last night's game against Pedro Martinez. Montreal with a tremendous pitching staff. They're second in earned run average in the National League, second to Atlanta. Grounded to first, easy play for Floyd. That's 16 in a row. Ken Hill, eight and three on the year. He had his only no decision of the season, his last outing last Sunday against the Chicago Cubs. He left the game leading four to two. Cubs tied it with single runs in the eighth and ninth. The game eventually won by the Expos. One ball, no strikes to Kevin McReynolds. He's as close to being unhittable right now as any pitcher the Mets have seen in some time. Even though Martinez last night pitched a three hitter, I think Ken Hill has better stuff tonight. His location has been marvelous. Two balls and a strike to McReynolds, who doubled in a run in the first inning. Two balls, two strikes to Kevin. Five and two thirds innings, three hits, five strikeouts, no walks. That's got. Two runs and three hits in the first inning. They've been shut down ever since. They haven't had a base runner since the first. And of the 17 outs recorded by Ken, only four in the air. That is 16 in a row, retired by Ken Hill. Four to two Expos. We go to the seventh after this from Bud Light. With Montreal on top, four to two here in the seventh inning. Back in to take you for the rest of the way. Here's Ralph. All right, Tim, and Marquise Grissom will lead it off against Bobby Jones. Grissom with a single, a walk, and a flyout. One for two tonight. Jones starts off with a curve for ball one. Grissom at 263. Two balls, no strikes. Jones has faced the Expos one other time. That was back in September of 93. He was the losing pitcher in that game six to three. He worked six innings, gave up nine hits and three earned runs. He has pitched the Mets only shutout this year. Came into this game with a record of six and four. Made his major league debut against the Phillies and won his first game start in the major leagues. That is ball three, three balls and one strike. Uh, the, the one shame about this uh, ball club, Ralph, is that uh, they are such a good young club and they're not drawing beans up in uh, Montreal, a franchise that uh, frankly could be in trouble. Montreal drawing 508,000 people this year. That is dead last in the National League. And having a good year. Been winning ball games, 12 games over 500. Good road record and a good home record. 
This guy Eno gets it over there in time and Grissom who can get down the line is thrown out. Let's take a look at the American Express financial update to today on Wall Street. Dow Jones was up 20.31 standard poor up point eighty one gold up a half a buck and silver up a penny. That's our American Express financial update for June 10th 1994. And on this date in 1944 a fellow named Joe Nuxall became the youngest player to ever play in the major leagues. He was 15 years old. 10 months and 11 days old and he came in to pitch for the Cincinnati Reds June the 10th fastball a strike call that's one and one Cliff Floyd the batter one for three tonight Joe Nuxall broadcasting for the Cincinnati Reds as we speak that's ball two two balls and one strike. Two and one the count. Reds having a good year going for them. They're tied for first with Houston. Chopper out to the mound. And Bobby Jones has time to complete the play to first in time to get Cliff Floyd. So two men out. That'll bring up Moises Alou, and he is two for two with a walk. In this series, he's been on base seven out of eight times. Four for five in last night's ball game. Two home runs. Five runs batted in. In this game, he is two for three. Make that two for two with a walk. And he has a home run and three runs batted in. And Huntley in a little encounter with the home plate umpire, Jeff Kellogg. Yeah, I think, uh, see, Todd has questioned a lot of calls with Kellogg all night from an offensive standpoint. And I think what he's telling Kellogg is that be consistent because he felt like Jeff has not been calling the same pitches both ways. Bobby Jones has had a lot of close pitches in this game that Kellogg has called low and I don't know whether he ran Todd or not. The one thing umpires do not want you to do is show him up especially the home plate umpire. That means don't turn around. Hunley has not turned around, but maybe in Kellogg's opinion, he had gone too far. We'll see. Bruce Freeman has come in to try and restore some order, and uh, now it's Bobby Bonilla talking to Bruce. I think uh, Todd got ran. Looks like he's backing up. He's still saying something as he goes back to the bench, so Huntley will be out of the ball game. Jimmy catchers get run. I'm grammatically incorrect. <laughs> Hunley is run. He didn't got ran. <laughs> I like got ran. That sounds better. <laughs> sound like a ball player. So Todd is ejected from this game. Kind of a delayed action on Kellogg's part. You can see uh, Jeff uh, has a little dry mouth. I'm sure he didn't like to do that, but I guess he felt that he had uh, taken enough off of Todd Hunley. Well, we'll check it out and see if we can pick up what started all this. Oh, he's gone right there. So Kelly Sinet will take over the catching duties for the New York Mets. He'll bat in Hudley's batting position in the batting order. That would be the seventh batting position. Stanet had caught the three games in Colorado and had a tremendous series there. He was 8 for 13, hitting 6.15. So he takes over with 
Alou the batter. Two men up, we're in the top of the seventh inning. Montreal leading by a score of four to two. And a drive to left. And Reynolds right there, and he hauls that line drive down, and that retires his side. So Stanette calls one pitch, and it turns into an out. The score at the end of six and a half innings. Montreal for the Mets two, and here's a word from Snapple. The tie, but they haven't had a base runner since the first inning, as Ken Hill has sharpened up considerably after giving up two runs on three hits in the first inning. 17 batters retired in a row by Ken Hill and he'll be working to Bobby Bonilla the last man to get on base against him. Bonilla singled the right field in the first inning to drive in the Mets second run. And Bonilla goes after the fastball fouls it back into the stands out of play. Mets and Expos have met four times this year. The Mets have won two and the Expos two. The Expos have won seven of their last eight. The Mets have won two of their last ten. Fastball just missing. One ball, one strike. Ken Hill with the Expos has won 33 games and lost 19 since coming to the Expos for Andres Galarraga a few years ago. Ball hit the left field, but a little there to track it down, one away. That will bring up Joe Orsilak, who has over two. Twice he has grounded out to the first baseman. And a look at our Macy's National League scoreboard. Dodgers over the Cubs two to one. The Cubs have lost ten in a row. Phillies lead the Cardinals. The Phillies just ahead of the Mets. Cardinals in third place. Pirates leading their ball game and the Reds leading there. Base hit to left field as Orsola comes up with a base hit. And the Mets have their fourth hit of the game. That's an example of a, an experienced hitter making an adjustment during the ball game. The first two times up, Orsola tried to pull the ball off Ken Hill. He ended up grounding weakly to first. And this time he said, uh uh, I'm going with you. And he does. Hill have retired 18 straight batters before the base hit by Orsalak, and now the time runners at the plate. And the batter is David Segui. He's 0 for 2. Mel Rojas starting to throw in the bullpen for Montreal. The fastball for ball one. Hill's lifetime record against the Mets, 6 and 4. The Mets beat him twice last year. He did not win a game against the Mets. Lifetime record 56 wins 51 losses but he has come on to be a very strong pitcher after being traded to Montreal by the St. Louis Cardinals. One strike make that one ball the count and held the first career career pitching records are kind of like earn run averages for relievers they don't tell you the whole story if you give a career record of a guy like Hill you see is right around 500 but it doesn't tell you what kind of pitcher he is right now one ball no strikes and right on the outside corner one and one guy who came up and learning how to pitch with the St. Louis Cardinals everybody knew he had a good arm such a good arm that he was traded uh, for a future National League batting champ traded for Andres Galarraga three years ago Galarraga hitting 370 last year became the first Venezuelan batting champ he did that with the Colorado Rockies of course and a drive down the right field line a fair ball extra bases Walker over to play it off the fence throws into the cutoff man or select the third and holding there and the Mets have runners at second and third to Segui doubles and the runner at second base represents the potential tying run and Hill makes a mistake right here the splitter is up in the strike zone it allows Segui to turn on one. Walker plays the carom rather well and holds Orsalak the third but now you have a situation where Hundley would have been up 
chance to drive in some runs, but Todd was run from the ball game in the top of the sixth inning. Kelly the net replaced him and he'll bat for the first time and of course he's a right hand batter and that will be all for Ken Hill as they go to the right hander in the bullpen Mel Rojas so Ken Hill out of the ball game after six and a third innings so far he has given up two runs the two runners on are his responsibility and he has allowed just five hits three in the first inning and two here in the seventh. This call to the bullpen is brought to you by 9X, and we'll be right back after these messages. Haas, two and one on the year, his 30th appearance of the season. He leads the Expos. Predictably, in that category, he has 10 saves. That's the one thing that you don't uh, look for in Rojas. He actually is the leader. John Wetland only has nine, and Wetland was their ace in the bullpen last year. But Mel Rojas feels like he could be an effective short reliever for a lot of teams, and there are a lot of people who think the same thing. This guy has great stuff. Forkball is best pitch, and he had 10 saves last year and 10 already this year. He was the roll age fireman of the month of April with one victory no losses and seven saves and his first pitch in the dirt to Kelly Stinnett ball one. Stinnett hitting 286 one home run nine runs batted in in Colorado he caught all three ball games and had eight hits and 13 at bats hitting 615 one ball no strikes time run at second base for the Mets so they can get back in this game. So that takes a strike and it's one and one. Hundley out of the game when he was ejected by home plate umpire Jeff Kellogg would normally be hitting. Hundley had struck out his two times up against Ken Hill on that pitch ball two two balls and one strike. Mel Rojas back on May the 11th struck out the Mets in the ninth inning on nine pitches tying a major league mark 26 times it's been done 17 in the National League nine in the AL and a check swing foul ball as Stennett tried to hold up on that pitch it got a piece of the bat that evens accounted two and two. Matter of fact, that ended the ball game. The last guy to end the game by striking out the side on nine pitches was Bruce Souter back on September 7, 1977. Mel Rojas is related, a nephew of the Alou brothers. So a family affair, and he strikes out. Stanett on the fork ball, and that's a big strikeout. Well, that's the one thing that Rojas and a pitcher of his ilk can give you. He can give you a strikeout, and that could be very important with a runner at third and less than two outs. Instead of a ground ball, you pick up a run here. Rojas comes in and strikes out Stanett. That'll leave it up to Ryan Thompson. Thompson 0 for 2 in the game with a strikeout. Joe Kerrigan, the pitching coach, out to talk to Rojas. To talk to Ryan Thompson. That's another way you could speed up the game. Once you bring in a relief pitcher, I think a manager or a pitching coach should be allowed one more trip out there, not two. Tell him what you have to tell him when he's out there instead of going out once he comes in the game. I mean, he's only worked the one guy. Good idea. And that pitch in the dirt, a good block on it by Fletcher to save a run. Ball one. Don't believe there's any thought by Montreal of walking Thompson here to get to a pinch hitter. The pitchers do up next. You pitch around the guy with a guy at third base, and uh, that could be a wild pitch. Good play by Darren Fletcher, the catcher. Thompson, one of the hottest batters in the National League at this point. And he goes after that fork ball and fouls it down, one ball and one strike. He had a seven game hitting streak stopped last night when he went 0 for 2. It's a career high for him. And in the seven games, he had 448 with three home runs and 10 runs batted in. 
He is second in RBI ratio in the National League. So in the position here to increase that ratio as he takes inside two balls and one strike. Jeff Bagwell one percentage point ahead of him as Lindemann comes out to the on deck circle to bat for the pitcher Jim Lindemann. Two balls one strike. Thompson takes ball three and it's three and one. Ryan Thompson with a three point eight RBI ratio that's one run batted in every three point eight at bats. He has driven in 45 runs tied for seventh in the National League and he leads the club in home runs and runs batted in 13 home runs 45 runs batted in. So with a 3 1 count in his favor Mel Rojas sets up again as Bobby Jones looks on ground ball and it's a great play at third by Barry to go to first in time and that play keeps the Mets from scoring at least the tying run. Barry at third base with a great play to turn the Mets away in the seventh inning. The score at the end of seven, Montreal for the Mets two, and we'll return right after this message. Well, a little let's go Rangers as the Mets trail by two. Montreal leading four to two and the batter for Montreal, Larry Walker, who's one for three. How about that? A Texas Rangers fan up here. <laughs> And the first pitch the to Walker the ball on the He's in the wrong ballpark. He's about 2,000 miles away from yeah. home, huh? He probably thinks he's at the uh, the ballpark at Arlington. Walker with the double in the first inning leads the National League in two base hits. This time he hits it in the air to deep left field, but room for McReynolds to get back there to make the play. Just a superb play by Sean Barry. There's Sean. Who came in the game for Mike Lansing back in the second inning? Runners at second and third and two outs, and you call it right, Ralph. As at least one run that he saved, and probably two, and the inning would have continued. And uh, this is one of those few times that a pitcher, if he had his druthers, he wouldn't be in there. I mean, Bobby Jones wishes he was out of the game right now. He's on the losing side right now. He could have got out of the game with a no decision for a pinch hitter. Or a win. Or a win. That's right. Possible one. And Jones working here in the eighth inning. The count one and one to Darren Fletcher, who is 0 for 3. Our Toyota American League scoreboard. Brought to you by courtesy of Toyota. Fletcher for the home run in last night's ball game off Mike Maddox takes that change up way outside two balls and one strike. Look at the athletics and Mariners there's something to be said about that ball game we'll tell you about it. Three and one the count to Fletcher with Will Cordero on deck. It's ripped to right field. Also, like a quick jump. Can he get there? He cannot. It's over his head. It'll be at least a two base hit. Thompson fields it off the fence. Fletcher goes in with a double. And he has his first hit of the game. Double hit very well to right center field. And it looks like a pinch runner for Darren Fletcher. It's going to be Tim Spear. One of their other catchers you usually in a low scoring game you don't see that often seeing a a catcher pinch run for because of his value defensively but Spear a better defensive catcher. And Joe Ursulak can't get to the drive to right center. And Fletcher has a double his first hit of the ball game. And that will bring up Will Cordero, who is 0 for 3. He lined out the center his last time up. Bobby Jones wants to talk to his catcher. Talking about that Oakland and Seattle game tonight, Randy Johnson is going in that game. And since June of 1968, 
when Don Drysdale set a major league record that still stands with six consecutive shutouts. Only five pitchers have thrown even four shutouts in a row. And there they are Bob Gibson in 68 Ray Culp in 68. How about that Gaylord Perry Louis Tion and Oral Hershiser long drive to right center field Thompson off and running makes a fine running catch tagging up in second is Tim Spear and he goes over to third after the catch but two men away and tonight Randy Johnson can join that group he has on three consecutive shutouts and faces the athletics in Seattle right here tonight so a chance to pick up four consecutive shutouts and maybe a shot at Don Drysdale's record of six consecutive shutouts and Drysdale went 58 innings of shutout baseball that record was broken by Oral Hershiser in 1988 and it took him 10 innings to do it against the San Diego Padres in his last start of the season but not last appearance as he was the most valuable player of the National League Championship Series against the Mets that year and then the MVP of the World Series against Oakland after that he hurt his arm and hasn't been quite the same since but still a tremendous producer for the Dodgers Sean Barry the batter Sean with a base hit his last time up one for two in this game he replaced Mike Lansing who was hit by a pitch he was hit on the hand and we understand it's just a severe contusion and no bones broken one ball no strikes as the Mets have their bullpen going Manzanillo and Franco are throwing out there for New York and the slider missing outside two balls and no strikes to Sean Barry runner at third base two men away top of the eighth inning Montreal leading four to two. Working from the set position I've never understood that as Jones misses again that's ball three three balls and no strikes a runner on third and not taking the full windup. We've talked about it uh, a lot especially for a pitcher like Bobby Jones who is much more effective from the windup because of his curveball. Three balls no strikes and he misses four in a row. Nope. Yeah. Four in a row ball four. And Barry walks to join up with Tim Spear on the third. That'll bring up Freddie Benavides. A pitcher like Bobby Jones, who is not a hard thrower, is more effective with his curveball because he can get on top of it from a windup. And his straight change also, there's more deception with the windup. No doubt about it. And still. Pitching from the set position. The reason why you go to the set position is to guard against the steal of home. And the likelihood of that taking place with a catcher running the third, I hate to say that, Tim. But pinch runner. <laughs> pinch runner as a catcher. Of course, the pinch ran for a catch. Now you see the curveball in there for a called strike. He's been a biggest bats for the fourth time. He's 0 for 3. Kelly Stinnett get in front of home plate and tell the infielders what he would do in case Sean Barry broke it first. The decoy play, hoping to trap the runner at first base into running towards second. It does work, but very seldom. One strike to count. Curveball again, one ball, one strike. ball one strike as Benavides bats with two men out top of the eighth inning Montreal leading four to two and a strike call so it's one and two Jeff Ken incidentally had an MRI today he's had a strained tendon in his right foot there was nothing more serious than that there's a possibility he'll be able to play tomorrow a medical report from the Mets one ball two strikes and again the play of the fake the third and hoping to trap the runner at first when Jones went toward third base the runner at first base Barry went back to the bag there is Jeff Kent who 
will probably play tomorrow. There's one way outside the runner going with a pitch and he might get a stolen base on that one although the Mets did not attempt to stop him. It's up to the official score. No I think he gets a stolen base easy on that and that's not indifferent. I mean you don't want to you don't want the runner stealing second. You're not indifferent about it. You care very much even though the Mets didn't cover. And I'm not too sure that was a good idea even though the pitch was a very difficult pitch. Oh he blooped it in the left field for a base hit. So that's a why it's break. not a, that's not that's why it's not a good idea. You cannot concede second base in a situation like that regardless of who the hitter is when you have a uh, when you two runs down in the eighth inning. That's the way I look at it. I mean the, the runner at third base is a catcher. You mentioned it yourself. Yeah. What's he going to do. What's a double steal going to be on. If it is then execute it properly and don't allow him to score. I don't think there is any way that you can give Sean Barry second base in that situation. Little looper by Benavides and two more runs score. So it's now six to two. And that'll bring up the pitcher Mel Rojas. I mean you've got one of the strongest throwing arms in the National League behind the plate. Now the runner at first base with two men out two runs are in and Rojas takes ball one. Might add that the pitch was a very difficult pitch to handle for Stanette but had it been a good pitch nobody was covering anyway in the middle of the infield. They just gave up on that play. Well it's not their fault. I mean they're told from the dugout not to cover but I just don't agree with that at all. One ball one strike to Rojas. Ninth base hit given up by Bobby Jones. And Rojas swings and misses. misses. Ross has been up just two times this year and he's had no hits. Hundred and two pitches, fifty eight strikes. And the curveball gets him. That retires aside, but two big runs for the Montreal Expos. Two hits and a walk. And the score at the end of seven and a half innings. Montreal six, the Mets two. And here's a word from the Bell Atlantic Yellow Pages. Montreal leading six to two, a pinch hitter for the Mets, John Cangelosi, and he shows bunt takes for ball one. Mel Rojas pitching for the Montreal Expos. Cangelosi batting for the pitcher Bobby Jones, who is on the losing side of this game. Cangelosi as a pinch hitter. Three for 13, overall hitting at 250, and he takes ball two, two balls and no strikes. Tim Spear is now catching in the ballgame. He was the pinch runner for Darren Fletcher, who was the starting catcher. The 2 0 pitch, ball three, three and oh. That's trailing by four. That base hit by Benavides after the runner had been allowed to go down untouched down to second, scoring two big runs in this game. There's a strike three and one. Tough pitch to handle for the catchers to net but there was no one covering at second base they were going to give him the base if he was stealing. So Cangelosi gets it going for the Mets here in the eighth inning on the walk. And that'll bring up Jose Vizcaino and let's check out the nobody beats a whiz game summary. Expos two runs in the first. Second and eighth, Alou, a single, a home run, and three runs batted in. Hill, six in the third innings pitch, the winning pitcher at this point, five hits, five Ks, two runs. McReynolds, Bonilla, a run batted in each, two base runners only after the first inning for the New York Mets. Vizcaino's hitting streak on the line as he takes a fastball for strike one. Vizcaino, 0 for 3, brought a 16 game hitting streak into this game. And tied his career high. He did in 16 consecutive games with the Cubs last year. Angelosi chased back at first base.
Head walk picked up by Cangelosi, the first given up by Montreal pitchers in this game. Again, Cangelosi back. Wetland now throwing in the bullpen for Montreal. One ball, two strikes. with his next pitch and it's hit in the air to left center field. A lot of hang time there as the center fielder Grissom gets over to make the catch. And that will be the first out of the inning for the Mets here in the eighth inning and will bring up Fernando Vina. Vina with one of the five hits the Mets have in this game. Singled the left field back in the first inning to start a two run rally for the Mets and that's all they've been able to do two runs in the first had a chance to tie it in the seventh inning but a great play at third by Sean Berry kept the Mets from tying it up at four once again Cangelosi back he has three stolen bases in three attempts Mets are last in the National League in stolen bases they have 11. Yeah, but where is Cangelosi going right now? Four runs down. I think the reason Cliff Floyd's holding John on at first base is the bunning potential of Fernando Vina. Third baseman also in. There's his strike for strike one. That's the only reason that Cangelosi is being held on at first base by Cliff Floyd. If he still holds him on with Kevin McReynolds up there, then uh, I think it would be a bad play. Back on deck, but Vina will bunt a lot. Mets need base runners badly as a changeup by Rojas. This fork ball fools him completely, and it's strike two. Well, that is nasty right there. So a two strike count. Third baseman dropping back to a position even with a bag at third with a two strike count. And he struck out. And he strikes out on the fork ball. So Rojas gets his second out of the inning after giving up a walk to the leadoff batter. And that'll bring up Kevin McReynolds. Now Floyd still holding Cangelosi on. And I think that's a real bad play right there. I don't think Cangelosi is going to go anyplace. Instead of playing behind him, I think a first baseman could play in the line and play off about three steps and still the runner, because of the possibility of a throw over there, he's not going to go anywhere. And McReynolds thinking about bunning to get on to give the Mets another base runner. Good idea. That's strike one. McReynolds a very good bunner for base hits. Reynolds in this game with a double and a run batted in one for three and he's fooled on that pitch so it's strike two. So Rojas has that tumbler going for him. Ken Hill with five strikeouts on the night had a good fork ball relieved by a better fork ball if possible. Rojas doesn't have the sinker that Hill has, but he can match him with the splitter. Foul ball keeps the count at strike two. and relief of Ken Hill. And a line drive base hit to left field. McReynolds with his second hit of the game and 
That will bring up Bobby Bonilla. Rojas tried to sneak a fastball by McReynolds. Kevin said, uh-uh. And with Bonilla coming up, they're going to make a pitching change. Felipe Alou will go to his ace in the bullpen, John Wetland. So Rojas out of the game. And John Wetland will be coming in. Mets still need four runs to tie. They have runners at first and second. Bonilla at the plate with two men out. We're in the bottom of the eighth inning. And with a relief pitcher coming in, here's a word from Chemical. Six two expos over the Mets but the Mets are with a glow of hope here in the eighth inning John Wetland in the ball game he's two and three with nine saves on the year Rojas had ten saves but John Wetland leads the National League in a very very disturbing category as far as the expos are concerned he leads the league in blown saves he's blown seven of them and one of them when Joe Orsillac Hit a home run off of him to win a ball game in the 10th inning. Orsillac, the on deck batter. So Bonilla, if he could get on, would put the tying run at the plate. And it would be Joel Orsillac as the batter. That's a very unusual uh, shirt to be wearing at Shea Stadium. <laughs> Must be a fan of John Wetland's. In that game up in Montreal, if you remember, John Cangelosi had a hit off the bag off of Wetland to tie it in the ninth inning to set the stage for Orsalak, who homered in the tenth. So Cangelosi, the runner at second base, and behind him, Kevin McReynolds at first base, and Bobby Bonilla, the batter, and Bonilla one for three in the game. He needs to get on to get the time run to the plate. Two men out, bottom of the eighth inning. Wetland with a good fastball, and he goes to the fastball. Bonilla fouls it back into the stands. Paid attendance for tonight's game, 19,924. And Bonilla with a count of strike one. Bonilla singled the drive in the Mets' second run in the first inning. Mets didn't have another hit in the game until the seventh inning when Orsillac singled. One strike to count. Curveball, it's in there perfectly. Strike two. I think John Wetland's got the best overhand curveball in the National League. You just do not see rotation like that. That is a nasty, nasty. Curveball. 43 saves in 1993. And he goes back to the fastball and rides too high. One ball and two strikes. He had nine wins to go with his 43 saves last year. An earned run average of 1.37. Orsillac on deck. His 43 saves, a club record. Bounces the ball, a great block on it by Tim Spear. And the runners have to hold the count two balls and two strikes. I think being a defensive replacement in a game is one of the more difficult jobs in baseball. It's twice as difficult when you're a defensive catcher as a replacement in a game, as Tim Spear is. That was just an absolutely brilliant block of that splitter from Wetland. Two balls, two strikes to Bonilla. the fastball rides high he gets something on it he gets it up there around 95 miles an hour it's a full count a walk would put the time run at the plate Felipe Lou talking about the fastball to Joe Kerrigan I don't know exactly what he said but fastball was in that sentence and the fastball rides high to Bonilla 
So a full cap. And it's ball four, and the Mets do get the tying run at the plate, and the batter coming up, Joel Orsolak. And Orsolak back on May the 10th with a home run to beat Wetland. High fastball on a 1-2 count up at the Big O in Montreal. Orsolak with a grand slam home run this year also. It came as a pinch hitter. Try to track down the date for you here. That was back on May 3rd against Mike Jackson and the San Francisco Giants. Can history repeat as Orsolak steps into the batter's box? He has a single in three at bats. Pretty good career average with the bases loaded right there. Fastball and Orsolak had home run on his mind as he takes a big cut at that fastball about letter high. The runner at third base, John Canzalosi. The runner at second base, Kevin McReynolds. The runner at first base, Bobby Bonilla. And Orsolak at the plate with two men out in the bottom of the eighth inning. Orsolak with two grand slam home runs in his major league career. ball call so it's one and one the Expos this year have had trouble in losing ball games in the opposition's last at bat they have lost 10 games this year in the opposition's last at bat the one one pitch a curveball did he swing and he is Called on the strike by the third base umpire Mike Winters, and the crowd certainly disagrees with that. I don't think he went around right there. Didn't I mean, look like could, it. Well, you could see the bat pointed toward the Expo dugout. I think the Mets got a bad call there. There's a lot of action in this check, but I don't think he went around. We'll take another look. No. See, see the bat, the level, the hands went through, but the bat did. Watch the bat. Nope. But it's called a strike, and now Orslack with a count of one and two. And they're throwing somebody out. Now, how can he hear anything from the bench? I don't know who it was uh, that he ran. Mike Winters, the third base umpire. Of course, he's looking right into the Mets' dugout. And now he's going to make sure that he's going to go have to pick the man out. This is over involvement by the umpire. There is, you talk about slowing up a game. This is really over involvement. There's no way he could hear anything. He certainly can see gestures. Well, what if the gesture is bad? <laughs> well, of course, there are some that might be considered obscene. It did not appear that Orsalak went around, though. Bruce Frimming, the crew chief, Running somebody, I don't know whether it's Dallas yes. or Tom McCraw. It's Tom McCraw, the the hitting instructor, trying to take up for his batters. Well, the second Met ejected from this ball game. The first was Todd Hundley, and now Tom McGraw, the batting instructor in the Mets. One and two, the count. One ball, two strikes. And the curveball hit off of the foot. It goes in the left field for a base hit. The Mets will get two. Orsolak comes through again, and he puts the Mets within two as he singles in two runners. He's a money player, boy. Joe Kerrigan, the pitching coach, out to talk to John Wetland. And there... 
are blown saves and there are blown saves. I mean, if Wetland blows this, it will be a an explosive save that he blew. Tough pitch. Curveball was down off the right foot of Wetland, and it trickles into left field. The Lou with no play is two run score. You may remember that Wetland started off the season last year breaking his big toe in spring training. He was on the disabled list from March 6th to April 22nd. Orsalak with a driving in two runs with a single to left field off the foot of John Wetland. And so now runners at first and second and the batter is David Segui who doubled his last time up one for three in the game and he takes Hine away for ball one. Now you're looking at a guy who's pitching with no confidence whatsoever right now Ralph a guy with great ability as much as any relief pitcher in the National League in my mind but he's not pitching with a lot of confidence and obviously because of all those blown saves. Comes back with a fastball that's popped up into shallow left field. The shortstop Cadero is there and he makes the catch and that will end the inning. But the Mets get two back. And the score at the end of eight. Montreal six, the Mets four, and here's a word from Motorola. Mets leading, I should say, trailing by a score of six to four. Some changes for the Mets, a new pitcher in. John Franco one and two the reason that he's in the game he would have been in even if the Mets were still trailing by four and the reason for that is he has not pitched in five days so Dallas trying to not only give him some work hope hoping that he could hold the Expos here in the ninth and that the Mets can muster at least two runs in the bottom half of the inning. And at first base Joe Orsalak moving into first from right field. John Cangelosi will take over in right. So Franco will be working here in the top of the ninth inning. And he'll work to the top of the batting order. John Wetland reached for a two out base hit by Orsalak to give up two runs. That will go on the record of Mel Rojas. And the Mets within two with a two run rally in the eighth inning. Marquise Grissom will be the leadoff batter for Montreal. He's one for three tonight with a walk and two runs scored. Franco in his 24th game of the year. And the pitch is taken for ball one. Franco now. Second in the National League in saves, Doug Jones has 16, Franco with 13 as the foul ball runs the count to one ball and one strike. Grissom batting at 262 for the year. Grissom taking a lot of time in the batter's box. The 1 1 pitch, fastball that is called a ball, and it's two balls and one strike. And Franco with another good pitch, it's fouled down. The count two and two. Pitchers a record in this ball game. The starter for Montreal, Ken Hill, on the winning side. He came in with a record of eight and three. Bobby Jones on the losing side. He came in with a record of six and four. 
And this one hit off the hands to the second base side. Vigna at second quickly gets the out. One away. So Franco retires his first man. He wants another ball. And Cliff Floyd will come up for Montreal. Often uh, in a game like this, uh, if, if you didn't see the game and you saw the box score the next day, you, you can't understand the importance of the tack-on runs. Uh, that when you see the game, you know they're very important. But those two runs the Expo scored in the top of the eighth, two huge runs at this point in time. And this ball hit deep to right field. It's way back. Angelosi to the wall. He has room and he makes the catch. So Cliff Floyd bidding for a home run has it turned into an out as Cangelosi makes the catch and that'll bring up Alou and Alou in this ball game two for three with three runs batted in. See John bending his hand and coming through that was a breaking ball to Floyd he got it up and I think John thought it might be out of here not only Franco but Cangelosi. John makes the catch right in front of the 358 sign saying <laughs> <laughs> Got away with one. And the pitch to Alou is taken for ball one. Lou hitting at 361 with his two base hits in this ball game and three at bats. Having an outstanding year as he takes that one for ball two, two balls and no strikes. Tony Gwynn leading the National League and hitting at 376. A lose second to him at 261. Fouled it off. Two balls and one strike. Alou came into this game with 76 base hits on the year. One short of being in first place. And his two hits now give him 78. And he might take over first place depending on what Piazza and Morris do. Mike Piazza of the Dodgers and Hal Morris of the Cincinnati Reds, who started their action the day with 77 hits. Ball three to Lou. The 3-1 delivery, ball four, so Alou walks, and that will bring up Larry Walker. Runner at first base, Truman out, top of the ninth inning, and Walker the batter. Walker one for four. Double back in the first inning, he leads the National League in two base hits with 28. He also leads the National League in extra base hits with 37. Lou, a good size lead at first, and Walker goes after the fastball. Larry Walker is the highest paid player on the Expo team. And for that reason, trade rumors have been circling around the right fielder all year long. Kevin Malone, the head of the player development system with Montreal, had a talk with Larry recently, about three weeks ago. And uh, Larry vented his feelings. So did Kevin Malone. And uh, Larry left the meeting uh, with a better frame of mind. And Dave Van Horn, uh, the Montreal broadcaster, was telling me that uh, Larry felt a lot better after it. And they had Kevin Malone on the other night on uh, national television up in Montreal. And uh, they said, is there a possibility of Larry being traded? He said, absolutely. He's the highest paid player we have. We're not trying to move him. We don't want to move him, but we may have to move him. And with that said, Larry was in a better frame of mind because now uh, realizing that uh, he has nothing to do with, uh, with his future. And that's brought about by the low attendance in Montreal. They just can't afford those high salaries. At least that's the approach they have. And the fastball fouled away. One ball, two strikes to count. Walker, a native-born Canadian, and he fits the picture well by playing in Canada. 
one of the best players that Canada has ever produced. Another great Canadian player was Jeff Heath, if you remember that name from the 40s and 50s. Outstanding Canadian. George Selkirk, who played for the Yankees, also an outstanding Canadian player. Twinkle Toe Selkirk, he was known as. And a good fastball strikes him out. A walk and one left. We go to the bottom of the ninth inning. The Mets need two to tie. After eight and a half innings, it's Montreal six, the Mets four. Here's a word from Chemical. Six four Montreal lead. Mets baseball is being brought to you by Bud Light. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down, make it a Bud Light. By your Tri-State Jeep and Eagle dealers. There's only one Jeep, and it's only at your Tri-State Jeep and Eagle dealers. By Bell Atlantic, the Yellow Pages, nine out of ten people use the genuine Bell Atlantic Yellow Pages. Also by Chemical, expect more from us. And by Macy's, we're a part of your life. And it's the bottom of the ninth inning. The Mets trailing by two. It'll be Kelly Stinnett to lead it off. Rally cap. Rally time. John Wetland, the pitcher, and he misses with a fastball for ball one. Wetland came in the game in the eighth inning. There's another rally cap. All right. That's trying to turn this game inside out here in the ninth. One ball, no strikes to Stinnett, and he... Pulls it foul down the left field side. One ball and one strike. So that in the ball game because Todd Huntley was ejected. And Stanette batting for the second time. He batted with runners at second and third. A chance to tie it in the seventh inning with one man out. And was struck out. Thompson followed him what looked like a tying of the game base hit. But he was robbed of a base hit by Barry, the third baseman. And that ended the inning. Mets lost a chance to tie it, and then Montreal added two more runs to take a four-run lead. The Mets got two of those back in the eighth, and now need two to tie here in the ninth inning. The count, one ball and two strikes. Catcher shifts outside. The curveball is fouled back into the stands. The count remains at one and two. The net will be followed by Ryan Thompson, and then John Cangelosi. Zanette with a great series against the Colorado Rockies. Eight hits and 13 at bats with a 615 batting average. Lays off the high fastball, two balls and two strikes. John Wedland started his major league career with the Los Angeles Dodgers. The 2-2 pitch, it's fouled back out of play. The Dodgers traded him to Cincinnati. He never played for Cincinnati. He was traded immediately to the Montreal Expos. Two balls, two strikes to Sinet as the Mets bat in the bottom of the ninth inning, trailing six to four. And the curveball gets it. Beautiful curveball by John Wetland as he rolls that one right off the table. Fans be with us again on Sunday. See Larry Walker and the Montreal Expos. That's at 130. The Mets will again face the Expos. Pete Smith will be going for New York against Gabe Smith. Of the Expos, Gabe 1 and 0, and the first time that we will see the Montreal pitcher Gabe Smith. And the curveball to Ryan Thompson as Wetland comes right back with the pitch that struck out Stanette, and it's strike one. Thompson 0 for 3, robbed of a base hit and probably two runs batted in in his last at bat. One strike to count. Thompson's next delivery, a hard slider that misses outside. One ball and one strike. Four-game series with Montreal. 
And Montreal winning the first game last night, nine to nothing, leading this game six to four tonight. The one one pitch, another off speed pitch is fouled down in the dirt, so the count goes to one and two against Ryan Thompson. Montreal three games back of Atlanta starting the action today. Atlanta leading Houston by a five to two score in the bottom of the eighth inning. And the foul ball. The count one and two. Ryan Thompson. A hot batter for the Mets. Needs to get on so the time run can get to the plate. And the fastball for ball two, two balls and two strikes. On deck batter John Cangelosi, who was a pinch hitter in the eighth inning and walked and scored. Cangelosi staying in the game and now will be batting for the second time after Thompson. Two and two, the count. Curve ball to the swing. He did, and the home plate umpire makes the call. So two strikeouts here in the ninth inning, both on breaking balls, and the Mets are down to their last out. Yeah, he went too far, it appeared. Watch the bat hit. Oh, yeah. That's easy. He, he draws it back, but there's a distinct difference in Ryan Thompson's swing and the one that Joe Orsolak had last inning, in my view. And now the batter will be John Cangelosi. That's down to their last out. They need Cangelosi on base to get the time run to the plate. And the next batter from the Mets would be Jose Vizcaino, who is looking at his 16-game hitting streak go down the drain. Felipe Alou on the verge of winning his 200th victory for the Montreal Expos. One strike to count on Cangelosi. Watlin with his next pitch of fastball, one ball and one strike. Whitlin came into this game with a record of two wins and three losses and nine saves. Fastball high, he's been missing with that fastball and getting his curveball over. Two balls, one strike to count. Expo's been on, they've been on a good streak. They won seven of their last eight. The 2 1 pitch, Cangelosi fouls the fastball back into the stands. The count moves along to 2 and 2. So now Wetland has strike away from ending the ballgame. See pitchers a lot of times with their glove hand where they wipe their brow. Once they get on the mound, any going to the face is deemed suspicious by umpires. But they use the glove hand to wipe their brow. The 2 2 pitch, and it is just inside. So a full count to Cangelosi. That was close. On deck batter, Vizcaino. The punch outs called on that pitch, and that's what Felipe Lewis saying. Full count. And the next pitch, fastball fouled away. So Cangelosi hangs tough. Keeps the count at three balls and two strikes. Expos led two to nothing after one half inning. The Mets tied it at two. Then the Expos took a four to two lead after one and a half innings. Added two more in the eighth inning to make it six to two. And then the Mets got two back to make it six to four. And the foul ball keeps the count at three balls and two strikes. 
Expos with nine hits and Mets have seven. And Wadland trying to close it out. Wedland's father, a well-known pianist in San Francisco and a former player in the Cub organization. Grizzly selected by the Mets in the 12th round of the June 1984 draft, but he didn't sign with the Mets. 3-2 pitch, and again a foul ball. 1984, when he didn't sign with the Mets, then drafted by the Dodgers in the January free agent draft in 1985. Three and two once again. The full count pitch. It is strike three call. So Wetland strikes out the side, and that will end the ball game. Angelosi unhappy with the call, but it goes, and the Mets lose it by a score of six to four. Ken Hill, the winning pitcher, his record now nine and three. The losing pitcher was Bobby Jones, his record six and five. We'll be back with a wrap right after this word from Bud Light. <laughs> 